gives me great pleasure to introduce our, our uh, guest speaker today. Phil Verster is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Metro Links. He oversees a team committed to transforming transportation in the Greater uh, Golden Horseshoe. Prior to joining Metro Links, Phil managed train operations, infrastructure builds, and infrastructure management for passenger rail systems in England, Scotland, and Ireland. Phil began his career in native South Africa in the electricity sector, so I think our hydro utilities will want to have a talk with him afterwards. He then spent several years in the UK at Bombardier Rail and at Irish Rail. And in 2011, Phil joined Britain's Network Rail, where he managed the second largest route in the system. He then ran Scotland's Scott Rail Passenger Rail Service and served as Managing Director of Network Rail's East-West Railway. Phil joined Metro Lakes in October of 2017. His comprehensive knowledge and extensive transit background has equipped him with the necessary tools. Metro Lakes requires to continue working towards delivering an integrated regional transportation system that will serve the needs of residents and businesses for years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm region of water and welcome to Mr. Phil Verster. Thank you very much. It's, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm surprised there are so many of you um, to come to a discussion which is a very short discussion um, with a very quick answer. And the question to do we need more rail services to Kitchener Waterloo? The answer is as soon as possible. So I've tried to squeeze those four words into as many slides as possible, <laughs> and, uh, and, and you'll see, therefore, a very clear discussion for us. And what I welcome about this is um, I've been in MetroLinks for about 18 months now, and um, I'm going to share two big, um, big ideas with you today that pertain to what is happening behind the scenes to get services, uh, train services to, uh, to Kitchener and to walk into the Waterloo region. And maybe through that build some understanding of, of what is happening. So the first big idea I'm going to give you is a sense of sequence of events that has to happen in terms of infrastructure on the broader GO network that enables us to extend services and answer, and once we've got that in place starts to answer the question about by when can we get um, the next step. I'm going to give you that as one big idea. The second big idea I'd like you to have is you can stop asking for services to Kitchen and Water. You can stop asking. <laughs> Please, just stop. Yeah? Because we get it. Yeah? We really do get it um, in the sense that um, kind of very, one of the things that I'm very, that's very important for, for, for organizations such as my own is to have good rigor around business case analysis and to understand what needs to be done when and what is the payback you get for the investment you make. And we've done that for the broader GO expansion, which doesn't include Kitchener specifically. We understand exactly what the merits is of the business case and what the payback is. And I'll give you a sense of what that is. Um, this is in the public domain, but for every dollar the Ontario government puts into GO expansion, it gets two $2.6 back in economic, um, in economic multiplier effect. Um, and, and that is a very substantive figure. We've done a similar business case for what does it mean if you've established the infrastructure, you then extend uh, towards Bowmanville, and we understand what the business case is for that, and you extend to Kitchener, and understand what the business case is for that. And the third one that's important is the extension to Niagara. Um, and we understand what the merits are for all of those. And, so while, while I say tongue in cheek, you can stop asking, I'm serious when I say to you, the case for rail services to Kitchener has been made. Now it's not a question of should it be done, the question is just how should it be done and how should it be done as quickly as possible. And I think that's really important. And so the, the, sometimes when you haven't got something, then you think there needs to be one big event for it to happen. And um, I know Mike and his team, I worked very closely with Mike over the last couple of, uh, the, the last year and a half to support the, the great work uh, the region is doing to get the LRT to run. 
Um, that, that's a type of an event. You've got nothing and it's going to be this event that's going to happen. Now, the GO services is a different proposition. Um, and I'll show you in the slides that the, because we understand the economics behind developing services to Kitchener, we are continuously rolling it out, continuously increasing it, and I'll show you the, the service growth and the number of seats. Uh, we, we now have additional in the 10 services we run, which is more than the 8 services we run last year, um, has given a 35% increase, and I'll show that in the slides today. And you will see us continuously to roll and increase services gradually over the coming years, and as we run more services, we'll get closer and closer to that two-way, two all-day service somewhere in the future. So when you leave here today, you'll, you can have that as a, as a very firm in understanding that, some, that we will gradually continue to increase services, and when you look at the presentation, I'll take you through, um, you, you'll understand why it is a gradual process to get us there. Um, bland photo, but an important investment. Um, this is our bus facility uh, that we've opened uh, back end of last year um, to show our commitment to bus services um, and to, to regional bus services. I say that with full knowledge that this week we announced that we're going to curtail one bus service, bus service 24, um, that runs from Milton down to a, a train meet um, on the go line and we're closing it because it's financially not viable. We had 8 to 10 percent occupancy rate and uh, had about 11 percent revenue coverage for costs. So we do invest in our bus services very clearly, but we run, Metrolinx runs as a business. I think in the past maybe it ran with different policy objectives or different business or more as a bureaucracy or government. My, my objective is to run Metrolinx as a business, so we make business decisions, the hard decisions and the good decisions, but we get rigor there, and my experience is you get a heck of a lot more done. If you just do, do it as a business, we do it and operate like that. You need to also get a sense after today that we are investing huge amounts of money in the kitchen line. I could have had photos up here, which I deliberately didn't, because I know it's Cambridge and Kitchener, but I could have had photos up on Bramley, which is further down the road. Um, but we, the 308 million, roughly, that we're investing at this point in time, includes 76 million that we paid for the line from, uh, from Georgetown up to Kitchener, which we are now doing quite a lot of work on in order to refurbish the line. I'm going to show you a few photos of that and talk you through that. Um, we have, we are spending around 115 million, both in parking and the upgrades for the Bramley itself. At Georgetown, we spent around 85 million, and Mount Pleasant, we spent um, another 20 or 30 million or so. So in total, we are, we, we are putting a lot of money into this line already. Yeah? And, and I think that's really important. The thing with railway infrastructure is, very often you need to get it built, and it's, it's not it's, uh, the, the photo I'm going to show you of some of the work we do is of a level crossing. I mean, it's not exciting, sexy, presentable photographs of huge progress where someone cuts a ribbon and sees a level crossing. You know, it, it, it follows. So there's, it, it's, it's boring stuff, but it's boring stuff that needs to be done um, to give customers a decent ride, try and reduce the journey times as much as possible, and to, to make progress, and we can give you a sense of that. Um, I want to talk to you somewhat, to give you a sense of what has sort of held things up a little bit. Um, and, and what I've got over here, if you just look at this, that, that's the line from Bramley to Georgetown, and over here, this is CN's most important route into the United States. And, and what we've done is we've taken this line and we've blown it up and show you how many lines are running here. And the, dark, the black lines are lines owned by CN. And the green is infrastructure we've already bought, an infrastructure that I negotiated with CN last year we will build. Um, and you can see there was a two-line section and we've literally built one line two-thirds of the way already. 
And that's a huge investment, not included in the 308 million I talked to, to you about earlier. And here you can see we're going to add that purple section in the next, um, in the next two or three years. Um, and we're going to add this. This is what's called a great separation, basically a bridge that takes our trains and will run. As you can see, they, we come over here, we come from Toronto. We run on the south side of the track. And we need to get to the north side of the track because here trains would have to cross each other's paths. Freight trains coming from, sea, from, from the States and, and us wanting to go to Kitchener, which is over here somewhere. Um, and so this is basically a huge bridge that takes us from the south track to the north track. Then we'll use that part of the line, which is CNs, and we build them with a little blue line as well that adds in there. That's a couple of hundred million of investment that we're going to put in place. So, Answering your first question, by when are we going to get two-way all-day train services after we've done that? And I said, there's a couple of hundreds of millions of investment, um, and that will be built in the next three to four years or so. So really important to get that going. That is, uh, we, we are in the EA process and we're busy finalizing that. And that is necessary to give us an answer to run all day servers in perpetuity. Now, if you ask me as a railway person, is the existing infrastructure enough that if we can run tighter schedules, can we still run at least something that is close to a, a, a two way all day server somewhere in the future? With a few things done here and there. I would say to you as a railway person, yeah, we can figure out some way to do that. And so what we are doing now is we're working very closely with CN to agree on, a, on an operational model that allows us to run, before we've done all of this cap capital work, before we've completed all of this, can we over the next couple of years gradually continue to increase our services so it's not a big bang effect like the LRT that you have to have everything built before you can run the service. And so therefore, while I show you that that's all that needs to be done, it's um, one step at a time, possible to make gradual service improvements and increases in the next coming years. And I dare say you're going to see quite a lot of um, activity from us in terms of increasing services to, um, to Kitchener. And some of these things would be ministerial announcements and stuff like that. So I'm, I know Ian's going to ask me today by when, and I'm going to say no, I can't tell you because the minister will make an announcement by when. But I want you to have that background that an, a huge amount of the infrastructure that's needed to get to two-way all-day service, which is all of the green infrastructure and the yellow, is already built. And, and, and that is, that's been our program of investment in the line. And everything else, this is the part that cost us 76 million. We've bought everything from Yara, so that green line is ours. And everything from Hallways Junction down, down to Toronto is ours as well. So the last parts of the puzzle are these connecting routes that we are talking about here. And this is now, that's all part of the business case and the investment that we are putting forward and now starting to build on. Um, and here's, here's the work that's happening already. So on, um, on uh, the Guelph, what we call the Guelph sub, but the line from, um, from Georgetown up to Kitchener, uh, we've got a huge amount of activity which started in November and the first six months the list of work you've got over there is all the work between now and the end of the year that we intend to complete to get us to November but we have done already something like 17,000 feet of rail replacement we've done around 5,000 uh, feet of reconstructing of rail the, uh, reconstructing of rails basically getting um, the rail level, um, when rail is not maintained, tr tracks aren't maintained extensively for many years, as has been the case on this section. It gets a little bit uneven, so it gives a very uncomfortable ride for customers, and trains go slower, and we are trying to get the, the time to travel between uh, Union and Kitchener to be as fast as possible, but, and, and we uh, using this as an opportunity to get as much of the kinks ironed out so that we can get a comfortable journey as quickly as possible um, into Union so we can run more services. 
And in terms of ballast replacement, this is really just basic good management and the, getting the truck upgraded to the standard we would want it to be at. And so in terms of sequence of events, in November last year we took possession of this section of track. And so you can see in terms of the, the right time to start doing this work was from November onwards. And we needed to have the investment and which was announced two weeks ago into GO, which the Minister has announced, which is a substantial multi-billion dollar investment. We needed that to be formally agreed to by government because extensions to Kitchener is built on the foundation of having a lot of infrastructure that needs to happen on the, let's call it the Bramley side of the network. Um, that needs electrification to get people the right degree of capacity and movement of people from places like Bramley and Brampton and, and, and Mount Pleasant. And that announcement has now been formally made. We're in the procurement process um, to secure you know, the four bidders, probably three, um, that will go on with that procurement. And providing that capacity as the GO infrastructure base load capacity was necessary in order to then put the Kitchener services on top of that and have the, the rolling stock freed up to provide a more intense service to Kitchener. So, so that is the concept of the sequence of time. Um, last slide, I just want to show you this because this may not always be evident or visible to everyone, but if you look at that graph, um, the, uh, oh, sorry, um, the percentage on this axis speaks to the red line. So you look at Kitchener for example, last year, September 2018, we had eight trains running a day, four east, four to the east in the morning, four to the west in the evening. We now have 10, but some of these are longer. So in terms of seat capacity, percentage increase in seats, that's about a 35, you can see it's a 25% in trains, but a 35% increase in, uh, in seat capacity. And that serves Guelph and Acton. And you can see the numbers of trains are correlated on this axis. So you can see the 8 and the 10. And I think what's important about this graph is you can see that the green bars are higher on all, at all the stops. And that reflects the fact that we've lifted our service on this corridor to all stations. And so perhaps share with you something on this. is uh, in, in the last 18 months, we've taken the organization and changed quite a lot of things in, in GO. So GO had a, um, a strategy to increase its services by around 2 to 3% per year. Um, I've set a slightly different target and I've asked the operations team to set a target of 25% service increase every year for three years. Um, last year we achieved 22% increase, we didn't make the 25% fully, but we made 25% if you count how many seats we moved. And so, if, if for what it's worth, I want to give you a sense that it's not really business as usual and then no one in Toronto is listening to what Waterloo wants and you don't get it, we need trains and you guys over there, so you, don't, you don't get it, you don't understand our needs. It's, it's not that, it's, that's not the issue. Issue for me, and I, right from the beginning, said that I've got three big priorities, and getting service to Kitchener is in my top three sets of priorities. And when I visited Berry, and Catherine was my minister uh, for a period of time, I said that consistently. And so our increase in services, yes, it's 35% uh, it's more seats on a low base. You may say, well, we need more. We understand. And so what we're doing now, on the line um, is really crucial uh, to get more services to run. And I just can't get to the point when I can tell you when, even though I know, um, you're not going to get it out of me. Um, but, but Ian's going to try valiantly, but he's going to fail. Um, so, but I can just, just have a little bit of patience, but have a little bit of expectation. It's close and it's coming and the minister will announce it. Thank you very much. Up here, Phil. But, uh, um, 
I wanted to just start by thank you for coming down here. I know uh, you know I chair the Connect the Corridor Coalition on behalf of many of the partners here in the room and folks right along the corridor from Toronto, Pearson to uh, people in Stratford and all points in between. And uh, we met recently with, with Minister Yurik and his team uh, and I'm uh, maybe just comment to start and you can comment it along the way. There seems to be a consistency with the minister, with the staff, with you and your staff around the need for and the desire for us to have the plan, the timeline, and the commitment of dollars so that we can see this happen. So I think that's that's a, that's an encouraging sign from my perspective. And uh, and all way to a go for us is going to mean fast and frequent, and and uh, we'll get into that in, in just a minute. Uh, and so I, I might as well ask it because it's like our version of the ethanol uh, pledge that U.S. presidential candidates when they go to Iowa have to give, which is, uh, and we've had uh, Minister Fideli, Minister uh, Beth and Falvey, Minister Smith, and they've all agreed that they are totally in favor of all day two-way go service that's fast and frequent. And I think I heard you say that. So that's, uh, you, you've taken the ethanol pledge that, that we have here in the region of Waterloo. Yeah, I, I think in, you know, People that know me around here, and Mike and myself have worked closely together, I've enjoyed working with Mike. We know, um, I, I, I like to understand what needs to be done, but then it's more focus on the doing rather than on more talking. Um, so I think, I think the, the best way to put this is um, previous sort of indicative dates of when things should happen, everyone focuses on that, but if it hasn't, doesn't really have substance behind it, then any date anyone gives you is just another date. And so I think it's much more important to get the substance right. And the CN line graph I showed you there, um, what we didn't get to talk about is, I spent about nine months last year negotiating with JJ Royce, who is the CEO of CN, um, very intensely about how our commercial rights along that corridor works. Um, and, and just to connect the dots on that, that is substance because you, some people in this room may be aware there was, there was always this thing about what's called the freight bypass that was going to get built and missing link and all of those types of things. That was five and a half billion dollars that was identified as necessary to put in place before Kitchener can get its services. Based on the negotiation with CN, and, and CN people are good people, that we, all, we are railway people, we are sort of all talk each other's language. Based on the good discussions with them, very tough negotiations, um, we found the right commercial mix to use the line that I had up on, on the slide there without having to wait seven or eight years of a complicated um, uh, build of a freight bypass. And I think that's more important than, than just promising a date. And, and that's actually the second question. So maybe I'll put these two together because I think they tie together. Um, you talked a lot about the, the recent service upgrades uh, mm -hmm. along the route that need to happen in order to get to the ultimate goal of, and I'll say in all my questions, I'm going to say all day two-way goal service. Yes, and everyone that's good. Say so get to all way two-way goal service. Uh, um, all the upgrades, um, what do they mean in terms of minutes? So, so when you to put practical, I think we had a discussion last time we were down and said, when you do uh, a grade separation or uh, you know, in, in re redo some of the, the, the line, you're talking in terms of minutes of how you get a two hour trip now down to an hour and a half or an hour and 15 yeah. minutes. Talk a little bit about what some of those those recent upgrades mean in terms of speeding this, the service. We'll talk about frequency later, but yeah. just in terms of the time, because that's, that's another part. The journey, the journey to Kitchener should be half an hour quicker than it's now. So it you know, um, I, I listened very, as an interested spectator, listened very carefully to high-speed trains discussions. Stuff like that. I'm not such a big believer in high-speed trains because I know what it costs to invest in that, and, and I think it's better that you invest in the basics and you take journey time, you take time out of journeys. When you look at our economic modeling, um, the value, the biggest value of to, to, uh, to riders and, and, and passengers is journey time, because that's time that they can use more constructively, either as personal time or as work time at the other end of the journey. So 
we are we're not going to achieve all of our 30 minute um, time saving immediately with the line because I do not want to be to do this by big bang event. I mean, if if I'm sitting on your table and and and, I, and, and someone like me says to you. I'm going to make this line perfect, I'm going to shave 30 minutes off, you just have to wait another seven years for that. Um, I don't, I wouldn't want to hear that. So I'm more into the mode of getting things done now, um, adding services, gradually ramping up services, give people travel options, create and custom. You and your radio show, I'm sure, will get some customers to join us, but I can tell you most customers take the rail because the neighbor is over for a barbecue and they talk about it, oh, and they can go, and they say, oh, that's great, I'll try it as well. Word of mouth is the biggest custom generator for us, so building service gradually, developing the service, creating custom is what we should be doing now. And throughout the next couple of years, as we increase services, and some, you're going to see quite a significant increase in services in, in the years to come, we will at the same time in, in, improve the infrastructure to get journey times down. And you mentioned the, the freight bypass for a number of years. All of us in this room heard all about the freight bypass and that was the silver bullet that was going to get us to all day two-way go and have faster frequent service. So you've talked about, uh, so maybe pair together the, the, the negotiation, which is taking advantage of what were existing yeah. rights within the contract that, that either the province or GO or Metrolinx had. Uh, along with those changes. So, so when you prepare those two together, to, and again, talking in terms of those are the things that are going to shave that, or chunks of that 30 minutes off of no, the trip. No, no, that won't shave the 30 minutes off. That, that'll establish the capacity. So you don't need to build this huge, I mean, the, the freight bypass was going to cross highways, was going to cross, you know, run in between hydro lines. It was going to be one of the biggest sort of concrete construction projects ever. I could never see the sense of it. So, and, and I, I, I was looking for other opportunities to achieve results quicker than go through that process because that was going to be really expensive. Um, so no, that's about securing the capacity. Taking journey time off is, uh, is basically done in two ways. You need to get your track and your signaling systems to be as modern as possible. Track must be as good as possible so you don't have speed restrictions on it. Um, because if track's uneven and you go over too fast, you derail the train. And that's not our business to do stuff like that. <laughs> uh, uh, Glad uh, to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 so, and the second way is to have some trains that have many stops and some trains that have fewer stops. Um, and then by having less stops, you have less slowdown and accelerate them. We, we have a service plan in mind. We have three or four service plans that we have developed that goes through the next following years as infrastructure becomes available. We know exactly what service we will kick in and, and what service plan we'll chop over to. So we've got that all modeled out and understood. And uh, at the right time, the minister will announce it. So you don't have to ask question I'll, five. I'll, I'll ask it again. You can keep punting that one. Um, let's move on to, um, so Metrolinx is now, the, or has been, but is the regional transportation agency established for not only GTA, but Hamilton and now under the regional water. So you have mandate for, for municipalities outside the GTHA. Um, and I guess our concern along the way, and it's having you down here with your staff and having you know, heard you talk today, but maybe reinforce how this region is going to put into the broader mix. I mean, you've got everyone from Barrie to, as you said, Bowmanville, uh, Hamilton. Everyone wants the same thing, more now, faster. And how are you going to put all of those pieces into the yeah. mix to, to sort it, of on the planning good, side? It's, it's, it's a really good question. So um, if you look at our, our plan for infrastructure up to 2041, our 75 projects, infrastructure projects, transit projects, that needs to be completed to get us to what we see as the right infrastructure we need for 2041. So, 75 projects. You, you, you need to be able to tell government and a minister um, how to prioritize those. And, and so, we, we've taken a lot of time and effort to put together what we call the regional roundtable, which involves 
all of the regions, and it involves Alton, Peel, um, Durham, Niagara, all the regions are represented, and big, big single municipalities such as Toronto are represented as well. And, um, and Mike has uh, Mike has been at, at these roundtables, and they are really crucial places where we set the priorities um, on fact in terms of what needs to be prioritized. And the facts are derived from what we call BCRs or benefit cost ratios. And when I say go pays back $2.60 for every dollar invested, that is the benefit cost ratio. Benefits of $2.60 for every dollar invested gives you a benefit cost ratio of 2.6. And so on that basis, we understand exactly and we've shared with all of the municipalities and regions what the projects are that have the highest BCRs. And, and, and to, to the tail end of your question, um, the kitchen extension is in that category of um, high BCR. And, and maybe just briefly explain that some of that. We've had some of these conversations about saying all day two way go, meaning coming both ways, meaning starting in Toronto and ending up in Waterloo, which yeah. is a big component, as well as people going from Kitchener yeah. or from the region into Toronto is that we know that there's a capacity that people wanting to come from Toronto starting here. How does that tie into the BCRs? I mean, that's, that's, that's new. I think you referred to it as new revenue, yes. which, which adds to the, to the, to the, um, uh, the, the, the benefit of, 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 the, of our program. When we talk about benefit cost ratios and business cases for transit, we're talking about just transit benefits. We're not talking about the wide economic benefits. Mm -hmm. So the benefits we, we are referring to are all about passengers and riders. So 75% of a business case is typically swayed by the journey time benefits of people traveling. Um, and the more people you have traveling both directions, um, the stronger your business case. And so the reason why two-way um, two go service to kitchen is necessary is that I don't see the single direction flow, mornings into Toronto and evening flows Toronto back out to Kitchener, as the way, as, as what the future uh, region is going to look like. Um, and you would know, or, or some of you may know, or may not know, but we've reduced our base fare on go from $4.70 to $3.70. And base fare means from the station you get on, for the first 10 kilometers, you now pay a dollar less. And only then does it start to ramp up. So some of you may have seen your fares increase if you travel long journeys because you travel really far. But by reducing fares for the shorter distance, we are now stimulating people that can perhaps in a couple of years' time see it as viable to travel from Guelph to Acton. Um, and we are stimulating those journeys now with our pricing strategy. We're putting two-way going not because we want to get more people out of Toronto to Kitchener. By all means, if there are people that want to do that, that's fine. But I fundamentally believe that the network needs to work and that we need to therefore stimulate journeys, short distances where people travel to act and then train to go and, uh, to Guelph and get off at Guelph and do something in Guelph and go back. I don't know what people do in Guelph, but I'm just saying. <laughs> The, the president of the Guelph Chamber can help you with that after you've been here. So what role will Metrolinx have in the development of the Southwestern Ontario Transportation Plan announced in the recent budget? So there's, that was announced by the, in, the, in the budget. What, what's the role Metrolinx is going to play and how does that sort of affect uh, what we're talking about today? Yeah, so, so we're definitely playing a role in that here. What's your next question? <laughs> Let's move on there. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, Moving on, there's, there's, and again, you've, you've touched on this, but you talk about the 75 projects across southern Ontario. Um, I mean, the question that's down here is what's your highest priority? It's obviously all day two week go to Kitchener, but how do you put that? That was a joke. So, um, yeah. but how, how do you, how, how will you provide yeah. the advice to the minister? Not what advice, but what, what are the pieces that will go into saying, here's how you should look at developing the network. Because uh, it is important, and I think you've said at the beginning, it's not a question of if, but when, and, and getting some things done. But what, what kind of advice is going in so that you can, you can you know, you can't do all 75 at, at once. Um, how, how will you uh, provide that advice? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Obviously, 
the way you make sense of all of this is you start off with things like a benefit cost ratio, which puts dollar signs of economic benefit against dollar signs, signs of investment. But then, as we all know, dollar signs doesn't speak the whole story, it doesn't speak to the whole truth of an investment. Um, my three biggest priorities are um, to create a network effect that gives a better, faster, easier service to all of the communities we serve, and connecting communities. And when you think of connecting communities in a way that's faster and better and easier, and you think about a Presto product that's, that's easy to use, you think about line speeds and journey times that are as short as possible, line speeds as high as possible, and you think about getting the network to really work. Um, Kitchener has built a very strong presence um, around uh, the Waterloo region, built a very strong presence around this innovation corridor um, uh, sort of uh, definition you've built. And, and I've, I've been to some of the businesses in Kitchener and I've seen in, in, in real terms how crucial it is to get that type of connectivity going. Um, and I mean, with each of my ministers, and I really enjoy working with Catherine as well, I've said my three biggest priorities, um, um, and, and, and in no order, but are to get Go Expansion to work, and to get the three biggest extensions out there, which Niagara, Kitchen, and Global going. And now, obviously on the list as well, probably has moved up to number one, is to build subways, and, and, and we're going to do that with, 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 with vigor. Um, but, you know, when you, the thing that, I, I'm just telling you, so, so I'm one of the few people that don't own a car, out of principle. I travel everywhere, by either bus or public transit or Uber or Lyft. Um, and, 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 and I didn't enjoy today traveling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I don't, I don't like coming to Kitchener by car, I don't like it, so, um, so and, and I think if we want to change how people look at um, how they travel and, and how they take transit seriously, how transit works, uh, we have to, it, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a way of traveling, it's a way, and, and if we want to establish it and be serious about it, We've got to get these extensions along the main arteries that feed into this, into Toronto to work, and, and Kitchen is one of those arteries. Just to, at lunch we were talking about uh, how the 401 is an example, it's perpetually in, uh, um, in construction, of widening and adding capacity. So we talked about the CN bypass, and so that, that, has, that, has, uh, that, that relationship's changed. Can you talk a little, just yeah. briefly about, you know, and the substitute for that, as you described, is adding, taking advantage of the commercial um, rights under the, of that you yeah. have, enhancing that. At what point will it become where we sort of squeeze en uh, enough of the, uh, the, the the juice out of that lemon to 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 add the capacity you need? It, will there come a point where um, you you can't you know have the have the joint? Um, um, Use of that of that not, thing, or not not, the, not the in the near future. Not in your my lifetime. So, so there's there's lots of capacity to get where we want to get. Think to. think of Bramley to Georgetown. It's it's just over a 20 kilometer stretch, and we're talking about a whole dedicated sort of uh, us having our own dedicated line, in effect, of what we have there, and we have bypass facilities at every at every station. It's easily run. Um, a two-way service um, all day um, to a frequency that that's commensurate with what we see as the demand on the load here. So I, I think it'll be fine. Okay. And, and the thing is, the, the thing, the, the way you need to look at this is, if, if because that stretch is so crucial to CN, it is about coexistence. And I want to say this again: CN sometimes get CN and CP sometimes get a bad rap for being difficult to work with. Well, look. The railway people are like weird, you know, so we, we, we have our own way, we understand our own systems, we have our own language, and, and we get on really well. CN and CP are good people, they protect the interests of their business, as I would have protected if I was on their side. So we collaborate with them in a way, talk the same language, and if there are more extensions necessary, we'll put that in place. 
Okay, and we're just about out of time, but I wanted to ask one more time, if, you, if you'd like to break any news to the, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but getting, I, I want to reinforce this, because I think this is this is something that I, I think we had in, the, in several discussions that we've had, I know with the Connect the Corridor Coalition, having the train go start in the morning in both ways and going is, is critically important. So we've, we've talked a little bit about that. You've talked about how we can shave out about 30 minutes at what, once all, everything is done. Um, you know, the, in a perfect world, is it possible to get the, the, the service to 60 or 65 minutes from, uh, as opposed to 90 minutes, or, or what would it take to sort of speed that up? Or is that, is that a, yeah. is, is, does that require a, another set of, of um, infrastructure? Yeah, it's a good question. So, when you think about most people that sort of, not, not so much, well, not so much, into the logistics of our railways work, but are sort of thinking about just what you are fast trains or cars or whatever run. We think it's important, and this is why this high speed trains thing is such a such, such a difficult <coughs> thing for me to swallow. Top speed of a train does not determine how fast you get from point A to point B. What actually matters is that that train can run consistently at a speed, it doesn't have to slow down and speed up. You take a quarter, a quarter coin, that's the contact that a steel wheel makes on a steel rail. Yeah, so that's the, that's, that's the surface area that's in contact. Now, through that contact, all of the traction engines needs to exert power to speed this train up through the size of a quarter. You follow? Yeah. And when it breaks, it breaks on that space as well. So you can see a, a train doesn't stop. It takes miles for a train to slow down and stop and miles for it to speed up and, and get to its speed again because of the nature of steel wheels on steel track. And so the real the real secret to get this right is to get the frequency up so that you can serve all of the stops but then have some trains that don't have to stop at all the stops. So there's always going to be 95 minute and, and, and more than that minute trains that stop at all stations to make sure you get a service. But if you have more than, we run 10 trains today, 5, 1, 9, 5, yeah, it's not really ideal to take any of those and make them non-stoppers because every station, if you have a few trains, need people to be picked up. But when we get the frequency up, then we can start to run some trains as what we call fast trains that doesn't stop at every station, but stops at selected stations and gets in very quickly. And then you don't have that effect on time of the train slowing down and then stopping and waiting for three minutes till everyone's on and then speeding up again. I want to thank you. I failed uh, science and math in grade 10, so that was a very helpful. <laughs> that's, that's exactly uh, where I, I, I needed to think. Uh, but I think we want to thank you for, uh, for taking the time today, and I think we're over time for questions and back over to Greg. And, and Phil, I think uh, you've left everyone in the room with a lot more confidence than we've had uh, ever in the past. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Again, I want to uh, give a gift on behalf of all of us. Now, bureaucrats and politicians are really reluctant to publicly receive gifts. But, Phil, you had a terrible trip here in a car. You're going to have a wonderful trip home eating Reed's chocolates made right here in the region. To Toronto, there'll be no evidence left, and you got a gift. And, uh, <laughs> you're giving her off the hook. There you go. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our sponsors again: the Platinum Sponsors, City of Cambridge, City of Kitchener, City of Waterloo, and the Region of Waterloo. Our silver sponsors: Clack Energy uh, Plus, Kitchener Hydro, Waterloo North Hydro. Our bronze sponsors: KPMG Enterprise, PH Milling Group, Enbridge, GSP Group, and Toyota Motor Manufacturing. And our host, Whistleberry, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for taking the time.